Hi everybody, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Kathy Brandon and I'm with www.kathybrandonspeaks.com and today I want to welcome a special guest. We have Jeff Klein. He is the founder and the owner of an organization called Speaker Co-op and he really is quite fabulous and quite valuable in the lives of so many speakers that are currently a part of Speaker Co-op. Speaker Co-op has been in existence. This is its 2013 will be its seventh year. And so it has really evolved. Um, I'll let Jeff talk a little bit about that towards the end of the program. What our intention today in this interview is to give you a glimpse of who the man is behind Speaker Co-op. Who is the man behind the Jeff Klein platform? You know, Jeff, you're known by quite a few people in the industry. You're known you're very well known in the Dallas Fort Worth area and across the globe for being a resource to public speakers, to small business owners. But some of the things that I learned through working with you and being a part of your communities is there's a man named Jeff Klein that we all like and we all think you're fun, but there are elements of who you are. There are things that have happened in your life that literally shape why you have this mission to help speakers and and, and why you chose to be in the business you're in and how that is continuing to shape the man you are. So I thought maybe we could dig in a little bit to you. Okay. And, you know, get to know you. Okay, so start us off at the beginning. Like, tell us, you know, where were you born? Do you have brothers and sisters? Tell us a little bit about Jeff Klein growing up. Well, um, I was born in Chicago, but I moved to Dallas when I was about three. And uh, I have two younger sisters. We moved around quite a bit when I was a kid. Lived went from Dallas to Schenectady, New York, which is upstate. I learned about shoveling snow and raking leaves, both of which I learned to despise. Uh, <laughs> we moved to New Jersey, to North New Jersey. Wayne was the town. Did a couple of years there, uh, junior high, eighth and ninth grade, mm -hmm. and then moved to Shreveport, Louisiana for high school, the rest of high school, and a couple of years at LSU. So a lot of culture shock uh, going from yeah. Texas to upstate New York and then from New Jersey to Louisiana. Uh, it builds character when you move that much as a kid. Now, when you, okay, so when you were moving from up north to down south, I mean, for a teenager, I mean, that's a pretty big social move like how did, you, did you have a problem with that when you were growing uh, up you know, I wasn't thrilled but the upside was I got to drive two years earlier Woo driver's license is 17 in New Jersey and 15 in Louisiana uh, so yeah. I got to drive shortly after getting there uh, so that was a bonus uh, right. um, I had you know I had to had to make new friends I played football so I had some easy, you know, startup connections there, but I didn't really, most of my best friends were not involved with football at all, but uh, I wound up in the drama club in high school, and I was the only guy going from football practice to play rehearsal. Um, right. uh, wound up on the quiz bowl my senior year, so, uh, you know, that, there were two of us who played football who were involved in that, so, <laughs> but uh, just a diverse... I, you know, senior, junior and senior year were great. Sophomore year was all about adjusting to a new place. Yeah, yeah. I can understand that. Um, I went from Dallas to Bunky, Louisiana as a teenager. So, um, yeah. We talked about this. I used to drive <laughs> through Bunky to get to LSU when, my, when I was going to LSU for freshman and sophomore years. Of and I bet, you, I bet you drove the speed limit, didn't you? You had to. <laughs> right. <laughs> that pull you over at the Dairy Queen, I know. Yeah, yeah. that was one of, those, one of those towns where you went from 55 to 45 to 35 to 25, I guess, and then back up on your way out of town. So <laughs> That's called small town revenue generation. <laughs> uh -huh. Still remember that. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on. Fast forward. Okay, here's this guy who was raised up north, got thrown down south. You're navigating it. And then, oh, good lordy, Miss Claudia, you go right into LSU, which is, in my opinion, the bear capital of the universe. So how did you navigate that, right? You're like uh, jock guy, drama guy, smart I, guy. I really didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. My first few years of college, 
I kept decent grades, but I was just searching. I had five majors in two years. So my last semester, I had already decided I was moving back to Dallas with the family had already moved back and always wanted to come back to Dallas. And I wanted to get into the film business. But before that, my last semester at LSU, I just took a bunch of different things that I found interesting to figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up, which is a conversation I had again when I was about 35. Uh, <laughs> right. But uh, I had it when I was 20, you know, 8, 1920, and uh, wound up in a theater program at UTD, Texas at Dallas. And that was supposed to be a transition to get residency in Texas before I moved on to Ellis to uh, SMU was the plan to go to their film school. Um, I wound up staying at UTD because they had a great program in theater and I learned how to build and do things on a budget. Nice. And then they also had an internship at the studios at Las Colinas, which uh, at the time was the largest soundstage outside of New York or Chicago or Los Angeles. Um, oh, okay. This was even before they built all those sound stages in Orlando and places like that. Yeah. So it was a big deal. And uh, big movies were shot there like Silkwood and um, you know a couple others. And uh, spent the next dozen years running around in the film business with some time off in retail and a couple other things to keep going since I was self-employed. Um, okay, now I want to touch on something that I think is kind of juicy because we don't talk about it a lot, but I've just had the pleasure of, of getting to know you deeper. So uh, talk to me a little bit about how did your dad deal with this guy who was in football? They already knew you were a smart guy, and, you know, I didn't know your dad. I didn't have the chance yeah. to know him. But how did he deal with, like, in, in society, right? Because back when you decided to do drama, most guys that were in drama, like, they had some things to say about it. So how did, your, how did your dad support that? I'm sure your mom was okay. But. Well, yeah, I mean, performing kind of runs in the family a little bit. I mean, okay. you know, we uh, – so does sales. Dad was a salesman before he chose his profession as a, as a social worker running organizations, which is why we moved around so much. Um, he was involved in running Jewish organizations, and – he raised all three of us, my, myself and my sisters, to be independent, but creativity was always encouraged. You know, we used to draw and color and write. Um, Mom painted once upon a time when she was young. Dad, he did some writing, and he did actually, Dad sculpt, has, we have still have some sculptures that he made when he was young, and he used to do some oh, mosaic. Wow. The art creativity ran in the family. Um, but he just wanted us to be happy, so he never discouraged us. He he was one of those people who said, if you're going to do you know film or drama or whatever, you need to learn computers. You know, this was the early <laughs> 80s, so take computers, and that'll be important. I mean, when I was in ninth grade, they made me take typing, and I really didn't want to take typing. But when I was freelancing in the film business, I used to go do office temp work. Other guys were doing office, doing warehouse temp work even boxes and I was doing office temp work because I could type 60 or 80 words a minute and I was so I was doing little secretary stuff and uh, all the other people I was working with were having to go do uh, manual labor and it's because I they made me think typing that I was able to do that so you know, we butted heads as, as people do as when they're teenagers and you know when you're a teenager in your 20s you kind of think you know it all and then when you get a little bit older, you realize your parents were right more often than not. Um, so you know, we had a we had a great relationship, um, and you know I am I'm I'm am who I am in a large part because of the way I was raised. So. Now tell me a little bit about your dad. Tell me a little bit about the man he was to you. Like, you know, I think you're very blessed because you did have a father at a time. Yeah. When. You know, most people are not supportive for their creativity, so that certainly was a blessing. But something I'm hearing is that your dad, you know, I mean, do you think he was a visionary? Because that's oh, how it's sounding. Dad, dad was a dreamer. Okay. He, he dreamt of bigger and better things his whole life. Um, he almost bought a summer camp 
before we left Texas. So we would have grown up, you know, we would have grown up like uh, Kinky Friedman did. His parents ran an overnight camp and yeah. uh, had, had dreams of running an overnight camp. That that didn't that wound up not happening. Um, he his the proudest thing in his life besides us kids was when he got to Shreveport as the director of the Jewish Federation in Shreveport, he was he helped the town sponsor 30 what was called Refuseniks, so Jews in the Soviet Union. He brought 30 people to America. Oh, wow. So my dad was Moses, literally, right. yeah. 30 people. Wow. And there, they, you know, now there's a lot more than that because they had kids and grandkids and they live all over the country. But they always thought of dad as their Moses. So he was a visionary, and, and he achieved um, something that not many of us can say we've done. Actually, actually bring people to freedom. You know, it's funny. It's I've all, and it's funny to hear that. Is you know, I think that's kind of what speaker co-op is in a lot of ways. You know, people have this vision to get a message out, and you know, they don't know where to go and they don't know what to do and. Sometimes we know too much, right? So, you know, speaker co-op in a lot of ways, you know, is kind of, I don't want to say it's the promised land or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, But that's what I do want to say and I want to recognize is, you know, you are giving people freedom in the same way your dad did. I mean, you may not see it that way. I do. Um, and I want to congratulate you for creating that. There is nothing, and there never has been anything quite like this in the speaker world. And since most of us are so focused on getting our message out there, you know, the whole world is 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 on a mission to, you know, say what they want to say and and be heard. And so I think that there's a little bit of tie. You may have a hard time kind of putting yourself in the same category with your father, but in my way of looking at it you are creating a sense of freedom for people because you're giving them a place to go to build a dream that most people don't think they can do really until they see how easy it is. Yeah, I mean, it, it's certainly a, a it, not the quite the scale kind of comparison, right. but what I will say is that that what we do every month, and we've done 11 months of the year for seven years now, is share and educate people. So. We're giving every time we have a speaker co-op meeting, which we did in just in Dallas for five years, and then we've branched out to Houston in large part because of you. We branched out to Fort Worth this year, and we have folks in other cities like Atlanta and, and Los Angeles that were looking to start speaker co-op chapters at the beginning of 2013. What we do there and what we always will do is give education to people who come to the room. Mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, we, we, we've created things that, that turned a um, fellowship cooperative meeting into a business, but we will never stop offering that education at the monthly meetings. Uh, we also now have some free education online, which we're expanding that offering as well, so that people can get access to this community who don't live in a city where there's a chapter meeting. And so, yes, we, I will take the compliment about building it, and we do give, but I, I, won't, um, I won't put myself in the same light as saving people from communism. You know, in, in, right, and I totally understand that. Like, I do understand the degree of mission that your dad was on. Um, and obviously... You know, it's very hard for us to see how we impact people in our own lives. Um, and I don't want to make anything bigger than it is. What I do want to pull the distinction out of, though, is you know as well as I do, because we're both speakers, that if you were a messenger, you do have a burning desire to share. And it's as burning desire as someone who is in a country that's ravaged without rights. And so as much as you may find it hard to make that, that distinction, that leap, at the end of the day, if you take the flavor of ice cream and put your dad in chocolate and put you on strawberry, at the end of the day, you're still producing freedoms that people didn't realize they had. 
and then you're you're giving to the speaker market where every speaker is talking to 20 to 50 people about some way they can make their life better. Yeah. So the way I'm kind of looking at the mission that you're on, Jeff, I mean, I say hats off to your dad because, you know, he created who you are. But I can't count on my fingers, toes, or even my children's fingers and toes how many people you've impacted by just having the speaker co-op in existence. So thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk about some other juice, right? Okay. Uh, you are single. Yes. So what I want to talk about, because I want to ask you some real deep questions about that. Like you lost your dad over the last few years. And that was, that was huge for you, because I know what kind of inspiration and, and, and what a role model he was for you. And I know how close you are to your mom, and I know your sisters, they are just awesome. Uh, but here's the question I have for you, okay, is what made you wait for the right mate? Like many people who are at your age have already been married, especially speakers, right? Been married at least three or four times to somebody. <laughs> And so I'm not real sure how you how you navigated going this long without finding a wife, first of all. And second, because I know you, I'm going to dig a little deeper because I do know that it was a very, you have a very specific, you want something very specific and you don't mind waiting for it. And I really want to tease that out because I think that there are a lot of people who get into relationships out of pure loneliness. And I think you get lonely, you just don't, Deal with it in the same way other people do. You don't run off to a relationship to deal with your loneliness. So talk to us a little bit about that. You've been single. You're a successful man, so it's not like you don't have women that you can date and blah, blah, blah. But tell us how you deal with the loneliness, right? That's the real question. Well, I mean, a lot of it has to do with timing, at least, you know, why I'm still single. It has to do with timing. Uh, it also has to do with personality because I'm focused. And when I get my sights set on something, it's pretty hard to distract me. I've been called uh, a, a lot of names because people think I'm ignoring them uh, or thinking less of them because I'm focused on something else. Uh, I got in trouble as a kid when I was working in the film business because I was all about getting the job done, not necessarily all about making people feel, be happy that that I was next door, you know, that I was, I was doing my thing. And, uh, you know, sometimes, especially in business like that, where there's all kinds of egos, um, turns out there's egos everywhere, but in the film business, they're especially um, raw. And, and uh, so, you know, I was focused on making movies, so I didn't have time to have a, a, a real relationship then. Um, I was focused on going to film school at one point. Uh, I, you know, so the, the times in my life where I was uh, working somewhere that was fulfilling but wasn't uh, life absorbing is when I wound up having those serious relationships that that just you know didn't turn into something permanent. Uh, or at least not in the marriage. Most, many of them turned into friends that are permanent because they're still friends. Right, right. But uh, you know, you say that right. I'm looking for something specific, and uh, I, you know, I won't marry somebody who's not Jewish, and I want to have children. So uh, I'm going to be the guy at high school graduation in a walker or a wheelchair. Right. And like. uh, yeah. Not I'll, I'll, be I'll, be in, I'll be in great shape. So, but I'll, but I'll be that that white-haired or no-haired guy. Uh, at, the, at the graduation, uh, who everybody thinks is the kid's grandpa instead of the kid's dad. Right, but, right. Uh, you know, I mean, I've been a sole proprietor off and on my, most of my adult life. I have been, uh, uh, I've not had a roommate for 20 years. So uh, I'm used to living alone, but I'm not alone in my life. I have great friends. I have a great family. And, you know, I mean, you know, to get, uh, you know, we can, sometimes you get lonely. Right. And uh, I'm a voracious reader. You know, reading a book and being in another world is a good way to, to not be focused on being lonely. Uh, I love movies and TV, so there's all kinds of escape there. Um, 
you know, so the, we all deal with things different ways. You know, I've been working with, I've had some great coaches uh, over the last 10 years or so that have all helped me in different ways. You're one of those. Um, that have just helped me with getting business, with figuring things out, whether it's life or business. Uh, I'm in a real good place right now. You know, I have, I closed my ad agency after 10 years in business as Klein Creative Advertising because I'm supposed to be a speaker. Uh, just like I'm supposed to be a dad. And that's why I'm patient enough to recognize that there's somebody out there who is uh, going to be the mom to those kids. And uh, when it happens, it'll happen. Yeah. And I believe that to be true. One of the things I want to talk to the single people out there about is, um, it, you know, it, there's nothing wrong with waiting. There's nothing wrong with um, not being attached. And yeah, I was never a serial, I was never a serial dater, but I dated a few serial daters. Yeah, they and all then that, to be in a relationship. Yeah, and I understand that. I was kind of a serial relationship chick myself, so I do understand that psyche. And one of the things that I do want to put out there, I'm married, but one of the things I do want to put out there to the single folks, and I want to use you as an example, Jeff, is you know you don't have to settle. Like your life can be full and complete. Without well, what's, settling. what's important to remember is that you gotta like yourself if you want somebody else to like you. Right. Right. And we all go through those moments where we don't like ourselves for whatever reason. But overall, I've always had a good relationship with myself, and that's because I had good parents and and good friends and good family who gave me the self-esteem, the tools to realize that, uh, you know, it's going to be okay. Now, one of the things I do want to close, because I know we're running out of time, but we can certainly have more conversations. I know there's a lot more to dig into you. Uh, but one of the things I want to close with today is if there are two things that you have, because over the last couple of years, you know, anybody who's known you has seen a really – you know, not a huge change in you, but we have seen you get very serious, get very focused. You were always focused, but now you're standing right on top of everywhere you're brilliant. And so I guess the big question for me to ask in closing this is, what are two things that you've learned from your dad's death to the mighty, mighty changes you've been through in the last few years? What are the two things that you want to leave with the listeners and the people who watch this video for them to really step on top of in order to be able to have the success you have? Hmm. Okay. okay. Um, it's really, and, and I think I was talking about it just right before, and I think there's a whole thing about liking yourself and being comfortable in your own skin, which not everybody is. And speakers can be like actors or comedians where they're really shy and quiet and the, the way they get their self out to the world is by speaking just like actors do by acting and comedians do by making people laugh. And a lot of those folks aren't comfortable in their own skin. But if you're not good with you, then there's no authenticity. And the thing that really shows up, and I think that's a big part of what you're at, what you've noticed in me the last few years, I was never inauthentic, but I was often reserved because I'd been told again and again and again by people who were not that close to me that I was an asshole. And, ah. and I had to learn that they were wrong oh. and that I needed to be who I am and if somebody thinks I'm an asshole, it's their responsibility. Because That's a hard lesson to learn for anybody. It's, it's, if anybody. I'm telling somebody, yeah. if I'm telling you the truth and it makes you feel mad at me because I'm telling you the truth and the more truth you hear the madder you get that means it really is the truth 
<laughs> right? I know. And I have a reputation yeah. for calling people's baby ugly, so I right. totally, I and totally if, appreciate that. And if, if I and I, and if I'm focused on an overall big picture goal like putting the speaker co-op in cities all over the world, and you're complaining about the lunch at a speaker co-op meeting, and I don't show you a lot of empathy about the food, that's because it's not important to me. Did you get value and learn something at the meeting? That's important. If you didn't like the chicken, stop at a drive thru on your way home. But use the education. And again, that comes across as being an asshole. And, <laughs> and if you know, well, if you know me and you know where I'm coming from, that no matter what I say once in a sentence like if you're still hungry, I hope you'll stop at the drive-thru. Right. That's not what you should remember me for. You should remember the 90 minutes or the two hours of value you just got in, mm -hmm. you know, for your business and your career and focus on what's important. Because if you're focused on the little things, I'm going to make you mad. Mm -hmm. And I've, so I've learned to be more authentic and for it to be so that's the, the one thing is be comfortable in your skin and the second thing is that means you also mean to be comfortable sharing that thing that's what's in your skin with the world right 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 now are you finding that there is a trend uh, like I found there's a there like I come from the uh, you know I'm a minister's daughter so I come from that background and I come from knowing that business model which is not that different when we boil it down to actors, models, musicians. It's all the same um, promotion. Have you noticed a change in the consumer? That the consumer is... I gave, I gave a presentation last week where we were talking about how to turn your Facebook likes into hot leads. Mm -hmm. And when, one of the points on the presentation was that we now have educated our consumer speakers educators, coaches, trainers, we have now educated our consumer. And so the days of us coming out half-baked or, you know, um, we came up with an idea for a package so we're just going to throw it out there and we're going to pretend like we're living our walk, right? Those kind of speakers are not successful anymore. Have you seen a real trend coming from your advertising background I know you can see your dad wasn't the only visionary. I know that. So what do you see? Because you are a visionary, Jeff. What do you see the consumer doing in 2013 and 2014 with regard to the public speaker? Things are a lot. Things are a lot. Um, I, as I, you know, mentioned earlier, I, I dipped in and out of retail in the in high school, in college, and in my 20s, and even in my 30s, I did some part-time jobs. Um, in in the retail world, and the consumer relationship changed dramatically from 1980 to 2000, um, and people cared less about customer service and more about price, and the value proposition became a harder conversation to have. Uh, and then we work with so many business to business salespeople, where you have to talk about the real value not just the price. And what's happened a lot lately is people are saying the economy is bad and things are uncertain. And we're worried about this, that, and the other. And, and I will tell you, and I was not shy about popping this up on Facebook, that if you're basing your business model on who's president of the United States, you don't have a good business model. I agree completely with that. Yeah, Walmart I works. Agree. Walmart works. McDonald's works. Mm -hmm. No matter what the economy is, but so does Neiman Marcus. Yeah. And and uh, uh, you know Saks Fifth Avenue and Tiffany's. Mm -hmm. Tiffany's isn't struggling in their business significantly, but neither is Walmart. And right. those those are like the opposite ends of the of the spectrum as far as who they're selling to. Mm -hmm. And 
the, their consumers can still afford their stuff on both ends of that scale. Now, in this economy, Walmart's getting more customers than they did before because some people are shopping there instead of the med medium stores they might have shopped at before. But our audience of business owners and our audience of salespeople and our audience of business coaches and speakers and moms and dads, and these are just examples of audiences that speakers are trying to reach out to, those people still have problems that you can solve. And solving those problems is your job, and that's not dependent on the Dow Jones or which party runs your city or your state or your country. Now we're blessed to be in the United States of America, but I have no doubt that my model of speaker co-op will work in Canada, in Mexico, in Great Britain, in Egypt. You know, it, it doesn't matter what the, what the overall, um, you know, uh, government is. If people are sharing their messages that help people and help make the world a better place, the TED Talks are all over. Yeah, exactly. Everybody who speaks at TED is a potential member of Speaker Co-op. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. Yep, exactly. Now, so my, I think my advice, let me, my advice on the front of what do we do in 2013 is work with a, an expert strategy person like you or me, a business coach, make sure that your business model is sustainable, that you solve a problem people need solved in whatever the economy is. Mm -hmm. Speaking is not luxury cars. Right. And it's also, it's also not economy cars. <laughs> right. right. Now, okay, so let's talk about this. I know we've run a little bit over, so I want to I want to make this quick. I have a couple of things that you might be interested in. Um, I would like to do another little interview series with you where there were some items that we talked about here for speakers that I really would like you to flesh out, like your vision of where you think the speaker market is going and, and, and parts of that sustainable business model. Sure. You're recommending that speakers. I'd like to tease that out a little bit, and let's get some some of these new speakers and some of these veteran speakers a litmus test. You know, let's give them something out there so that they can say, "Hey, okay, here's what these guys are saying. It's coming. How do I measure up?" Okay. Right? The new guys, they'll be calling out for the help, and the veterans, we all know, they're like actors, right? Once we get popular, we don't necessarily want to talk about how much help we need. But we want to put it out there, too, because the veterans listen to us, too. They just don't talk about it. The newbies, they'll be like, oh, right? So are you up for that? Can I invite sure. you for that kind of thing again? Sure. We I should do a conversation around, you know, the the visibility booking, which yes. means you're not getting a speaker fee. Yes. You know, and we should do a conversation around targeting and, and how you should be niching and picking people that you solve problems for instead of trying to solve everybody's problems. Yeah, I'm seeing a big problem right now with speakers and the target market they're choosing to serve. Um, they're mostly not choosing a target. That's the problem, Kathy. It's not that they're choosing right. the wrong target. It's that their their target is everyone, or all yeah. women, or all moms, or all yeah. entrepreneurs. It's too generic. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's too big. Well, I was in a seminar, and I'll make this the final thing, and then we'll talk about how people can reach you. I was in a seminar, and there was this woman who has a successful business, six-figure business. She's a coach, um, all the goodness. Um, but she still felt like there was someplace else she could go, right? There was more, not so much more success, but she just wanted to serve more people, bigger, bigger, bigger. Well, what we found out in the seminar is she has a beautiful business model. She's doing everything everybody says. She's being paid to speak. She has info products. She has a membership, all the goodness. What we found out was at the end of the day, she has a lot of female problems. Like every month, she has to deal with this mass amount of female problems. So we were talking about her business, and she was like, yeah, you know, it's okay, but it still feels kind of flat to me. She was like, I'm just... I don't know. I don't know what the problem is. Um, I should not be complaining. And at the end of the day, when we start talking about her and kind of what she's about, and we ask her, you know, the $5 million question that I asked, right? What problem are you willing to die trying to solve? 
and what people would you die trying to solve it for, right? And because your dad was more than willing to die trying to save those people from a prison level lifestyle. He was willing. He he put himself out there. He could have had any results other than the, the amazing results he had. You could have put Speaker Co op together and you could have had totally different results than you've had over the last seven years of well I can count over a thousand speakers you've touched. Okay. So there are definitely different results that we can have. Um, I think what's really important that I would like to tease out, and I want you to work with people on their target about it, because you're absolutely right. People are picking a target, but they're picking something so big that nobody can find you above the noise. And one of the things that you helped me do, and I do it over and over and over again, is I niche deeper. I niche clearer. You know, who do I really want to solve the problem for? Of course, I want to solve it for the world, but who do I want to work with today? And so I'd love to tease that out. Now, tell us how we can get in touch with you, because we're starting on target market, and I can discuss that all day. So tell us how we can reach you. If we're in Dallas, how can we see you, right? Give us all the goodness. The best yeah. way to reach me is by email at jeff at speakercoff.com. There's no hyphen in the domain name. Uh, at speakup.com, you'll find uh, events, you'll find our monthly meetings, you'll find uh, training and education, you'll find free education, some free downloads on all kinds of good stuff, and those downloads are changing regularly, so we rotate those. Uh, Speakercoop.com is the place. Okay. Uh, we, you can see me every month on the third Friday of every month at the Dallas Speaker Co-op meeting. The Houston co-op and, and the Fort Worth meetings, I'm at almost every month, but not every month. And coming soon to a city near you. Nice, nice. Okay, so the best way to get in touch with Jeff is to email him at jeff at speakercoop.com. That's S-P-E-A-K-E-R-C-O-O-P. -E -E There's no dash in that. All together, jeff at speakercoop.com. I do recommend that you friend Jeff on Facebook. I think you're almost out of uh, personal friends, so if you're going to try to friend him on a personal level, do it now because I think you're running out. I got um, about 100 slots left on the friends. I We're thought you did. I thought you build did. Build a fan page. Yeah, build yeah. a fan page. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm wide open. I'm a lion on LinkedIn. If you don't know what that okay. is, look it up. Or ask okay. me. One of the things about Jeff that I want to tell everybody about, too, is Jeff also has access to National uh, Speaker Association. If you join the Speaker Co-op, you get to be a member of the National Speaker Registry. Jeff and I collaborate very deeply with the speakers. We make sure you get what you need between both of those groups. Um, Jeff has access to every single resource you could possibly need as a professional speaker or a business speaker who uses public speaking as your primary marketing strategy. And so what I want you guys to understand is if you're thinking about speaking, instead of running out and doing all this kind of stuff, the first step that I recommend to my speakers is get into a community where people can talk to you, people can fellowship with you. And then once you're in that community, then start making your choices on how you're going to spend your cash, how you're going to market yourself, how you're going to platform yourself, and what speaking gigs you're going to get. And so I do want to recommend that you go to Speaker Co-op, check out the community. If you're in Texas, I want you to run to one of the luncheons. Um, join the free community as well. There's a yeah. lot. Yeah, join the free community. It's free, and then you get access to a whole bunch of other goodness. Um, and that's it. I've got to close the interview. I don't want to, but I have to. So thank you so much, Jeff, for sharing who you are with us. Uh, we're going to come back to everybody who watched this video, and we are going to really, really tease out this target market thing. And we are going to make sure that everybody who sees our videos has the opportunity to niche in a place where people really, really want to hear your message. So thanks, thanks so much, Jeff. Thank Bye. you.